Now we would like to invite the first panel. This is uh, a tradition and probably the favorite, the most inspirational panel. I always come away feeling inspired. So if you would please uh, come to the stage um, along with the moderator, uh, Sol Chan, from after 14 years at the New York Times, Sol moved to the West Coast and last fall joined the Los Angeles Times as the deputy managing editor. We have a great group here on stage and we're really delighted that you can be with us. Thank you so much, John. Good morning, everyone. I could not be more thrilled, humbled, and excited to be here today uh, as the moderator for uh, the opening session in the Logan Symposium. Thrilled because this is one of the most distinguished and intimate gatherings of uh, practitioners of investigative journalism. Thrilled to be here with heroes of our noble profession, uh, including my friends David Barstow and Lowell Bergman, I feel deeply humbled to be here representing the Los Angeles Times, a 138-year-old institution that's also kind of a one-year-old digital startup <laughs> uh, being incubated out of an office building across from LAX and uh, under uh, new local ownership, California ownership, for the first time in 18 years. Very humbled as well to be in the presence of my colleagues, uh, Rosanna Shaw, who covers oceans for us, and Jack Leonard, our investigative editor, who worked on uh, the fantastic uh, and troubling series about the University of Southern California, which was just recognized with a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Most of all, I'm really excited to be um, kicking off this panel, because at a time of threats to journalism that come from all different directions, including the instability of the business model, the continuing uh, economic challenges that face journalism, uh, and of course the legal and other threats throughout the world. And I, my friend Joel Simon always reminds me that as challenging as things are here, uh, it's uh, a deadlier time, a more dangerous time, a more violent time uh, facing journalists than almost ever before in post-war history, and that's something I always keep in mind. Um, this panel is uh, entitled How the Sausage is Made, and I really want us to focus on craft. We have about 90 minutes. Uh, each of our three distinguished uh, journalists um, uh, is going to pr talk a little bit about her work, and then we're going to get into, you know, deep into the weeds, I hope, about methodology, sourcing, ethics, uh, communications, and others. Let's first start with Julie Brown, who's immediately to my right. Uh, she's an investigative reporter with the Miami Herald, uh, who uh, during her 25-year career has worked as a GA reporter, crime and courts reporter, education, Night City editor, and enterprise editor. Since 2013, Julie's been a member of the Miami Herald's investigative team. She won a Polk Award for justice reporting for perversion of justice, a series about how a federal prosecutor, now in President Trump's administration, helped a wealthy sexual predator avoid a lengthy prison sentence in Florida. Julie, I'd like to begin by asking you how you managed to uh, crack open a story that Lowell Bergman had, <laughs> had been unable to do. <laughs> well, um, I, had, I had the benefit of time uh, in uh, this was a decades old case and there was a lot of um, document the girls who are now women um, took a number of people to court including the federal government um, as a result of this plea bargain that this multimillionaire received so there was tons of documents to go through and I you know of course my editor when I told him I wanted to do this story was very nervous because we were dealing with some of the biggest lawyers of our time and a multimillionaire who had deep pockets to, to sue us uh, but I what I said to him is everything's going to be based on fact it's going to be in a document we're just going to bulletproof the entire thing and that was my goal throughout the project was it difficult to get support for reopening a case I mean the Epstein case had been resolved in a legal sense in the early aughts. Um, why revisit it? Well, it always, I think anybody who knows anything about the story, it always smelled bad. It was always everybody that would ever read a story about this said, how does it happen? And I thought to myself, I need to, to find out how this happened. And I thought, just like a cold case detective approaches a case that 
had been looked at a million times and was un unsolved, I thought I would do the same thing journalistically and go through this case from beginning to end. What was more difficult, getting the documents or getting the victims to talk? Getting the victims and sources, the police chief, other people involved in the case to talk. Might it be time to show the short clip um, that brings attention to some of Julie's methods? And we were underage. We were little girls. I was 16. I was 16. I started going to him when I was like 14, 15, 14 turning 15. If you think at 14, $200, that's a lot of money at 14 years old. I mean, that's a lot of money now. She's like, oh, you know, do you need to make any extra money? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay, I can give you, you know, like $200. This is this older guy in Palm Beach. He gets a lot of massages from girls. You know, that was it. They were recruited by someone who was adept at finding girls that would be willing to you know, go to a house for a few hundred dollars. And as it started out, you know, give a man a back rub, but many cases it turned into something uh, far worse than that, uh, elevated to a crime, and a serious crime, in some cases sexual batteries. My life would have been different if I would have never went to Jeffrey Epstein's house. It was just a dark turning point in my life. On June 30th, 2008, Jeffrey Epstein, a Palm Beach multimillionaire hedge fund manager, received what might have been the most lenient plea deal for a serial sex offender in U.S. history. The Miami Herald identified over 60 of his victims, just young middle and high school girls at the time of the abuse. More than a decade later, several of them are talking for the first time about how they were molested by Epstein and believe they were betrayed by the very prosecutors who were supposed to hold Epstein accountable. They came from fairly disadvantaged backgrounds. There was some dysfunction in their families. The lure of a lot of money was more than they were able to resist. I went from um, an abusive situation to being a runaway, to living in foster homes, to just already being hardened by life on the streets. The other girls that I personally know of that went, were coming from trailer parks, that were having gun shootings, drugs. My mother was on drugs at the time, and she couldn't provide for me, and I was pretty much homeless. One child would be lured over would be paid substantial sums of money, would be offered the further inducement of being paid a bounty for anybody else that she was able to bring to Epstein. A network developed where many young girls in the same kinds of circumstance wound up being victimized. The three of us slid into the back seat of the cab and we drove and I remember just driving down Okeechobee Boulevard and thinking how I had never been on Palm Beach Island before in my whole entire life that I had lived in West Palm Beach. By the time I was 16, I brought in up to 75 girls, all the ages of you know, 14, 15, 16, people going from eighth grade to ninth grade at just um, school parties is where I would recruit them from. All Jeffrey cared about was go find me more girls. Ju Julie, how, you were talking to women disadvantaged women who were violated and assaulted at the ages of 14, 15, 16. Um, it's been years for some of them. What were the kind of ethics, what were the ethical ramifications um, of your approach and how did you get these women uh, to revisit um, a period of their lives that no doubt has been um, unforgettable and uh, deeply, deeply damaging? Well, I did a lot of homework on the girls. Um, I knew that a lot of them, uh, you know, th this they had been traumatized multiple times, not just by Epstein, but they were traumatized by the legal system, um, the criminal justice system, in some cases their own families who ostracized them for doing something. They were essentially, uh, this was a sex pyramid scheme where, uh, you know, a couple of young girls got wrapped up into it and what after they went to Epstein's home and were molested he said you know you don't have to come back again if you don't want to do this but bring me some of your friends and for every friend you bring me I'll give you another two hundred dollars so it was just on and on and on you know two girls would come they would bring three girls and the next three girls would bring five girls so there were tons of girls out there and um, Essentially what happened was the 
people that were in uh, law enforcement, um, some of them anyway, and, and a good deal of the people that were in the um, prosecutor's office considered these girls prostitutes. They, back then, believe it or not, they actually called this child prostitution. And it was as if, you know, the girls were to blame. And all along, these girls, even till today, they ha have a lot of shame. They have been made to feel that it was their fault. And so I had that obstacle to overcome because even in, at this time, they still believe that to some degree. Did the, did the Me Too um, era play a role in, how, in do, do you feel it played a role in how your story landed? Me, so many of the Me Too stories, of course, have been about the predations of powerful and wealthy men. Um, your stories as well, but it, over really carrying out over two decades, if not more, of time. Right. And I, well, when I first started this project, the Me Too movement wasn't here. I started this almost two years ago. There was no Me Too movement. So in the beginning, when I pitched this story to my editor, he was like, you know, he was very skeptical. What are you going to really get that nobody else has gotten before because it had been written about a lot of times? I said, well, I just feel that because what the, the peg for it was that they had, uh, President Trump had nominated uh, Alexander Acosta to be a member of his cabinet, overseeing an agency that handles human trafficking and child labor. And I knew about this case. I knew he was the prosecutor that handled this deal. And I waited to see if anybody would object. And although the questions were raised at his hearings about it, he never answered the questions he was asked. It was like, it had slipped from history. It was almost like nobody re remembered what this case was about. So I started picking away at it uh, before the Me Too movement happened. And then uh, when the New York Times did their story on Harvey Weinstein, then my editor said, wow, we got a really good story here. <laughs> you know? So he kind of, kind of um, you know, he would have let me do it anyway. But, uh, but it did help, help push me over a little bit, I think. <laughs> Well, now when your I remember when your story landed. I like many here. I you know swiped on the various push alerts, and um, the lead begins with basically the the man who's currently the U.S. Secretary of Labor, when he was a federal prosecutor, helped you know um, minimize and and all, all but cover up like yeah. a gigantic child sex ring. That was uh, quite, quite something. Um, Acosta is an important figure in the story. How did you decide to make him the lead? How did you? Um, That's an interesting story that you say. Uh, I've been covering um, vulnerable stories about um, inmates in our prison system, um, women that have been raped. Um, I've just covered um, human rights stories and people, uh, vulnerable people for a very long time. So my first instinct when I got the interviews with the girls was to have this big, nice, long anecdotal lead about this girl walking into this man's mansion and going upstairs and, you know, this whole thing about what happened to him, which was pretty creepy. But no one had really heard this story before because these women were talking for the first time. So that, that was my first instinct to do that. And, and I, had, uh, I have a colleague uh, at the time um, who, um, who, you know, I shared my story. We both did it. He shared his stories with me. We kind of on the I team at the Herald, we all kind of help each other out. And he read, read the beginning of the story, and he said, this is really good, but this thing about Acosta over here is a lot better. So he, it was really, he said, I think you should leave with him. And when I you know, flipped it around and did it that way, I realized that it was much more powerful, because that was truly the story was how uh, you know, Epstein managed to manipulate the criminal justice system. There's a cast of characters in your story that's really almost like, yeah. You couldn't make this up. Uh, Prince Andrew <laughs> comes into the stories, Alan Dershowitz, Bill Clinton. How did you handle the, the trying to get accountability and get facts from people who live across different continents and have a lot of handlers? Well, I, I, I really focused on the court documents because I knew that you know we were worried. We didn't, of course, we didn't want to get sued. And what I told my boss at the time was, look, number one, Epstein's really never denied that he did any of this. So to some degree, and he got away, essentially got away with it. So to some degree, that wasn't a factor. I think they were most worried about Dershowitz, quite, quite frankly. And even now, it's, you know, he's still kind of coming after us. But every, because every, like I said, I knew that when our lawyers would edit it, they would uh, go through every line, because I've been through this before, like, how do you know that? 
So I made sure for every single sentence in the story, I could say, I got that from this document. You know, when I was doing my research, I would take the document that I knew I was referring to and I put it on a clipboard and then I had clipboards like this. So everything in the story was either based on a, a court document, an interview with the police chief who, this was the first time he ever went public, interview with the lead detective. Uh, so everything, I, I said I just bulletproofed everything. How did you organize the 10,000 plus pages of material? I had a whole room in my house filled with it. <laughs> <laughs> had boxes and everything was labeled and binders and clipboards and yeah, it was quite a project. Uh, as we sit here today, Alexander Acosta is still, is still Secretary of Labor. Uh, do you feel satisfied with the impact your series has had? Not yet. <laughs> um, I'm still working on it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm satisfied that finally, this is what I'm really ha uh, more, most satisfied with. Uh, when it was over, um, the women called me, you know, and they were afraid, you know, they've been afraid for a long time. And what they said was, you know, I just want to thank you because this is the first time that someone didn't treat us like we were prostitutes. And so I feel really happy that I found some sense of vindication for, for these, for the women. Thank you. Our next panelist is Hannah Dreyer, who covers immigration for ProPublica. Hannah recently was recognized with the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing for a series of articles she wrote about uh, Central American immigrants on Long Island and their interactions with the authorities, including both the local police and, of course, uh, federal immigration officials. Previously, Hannah was the AP Venezuela correspondent for three years, during which she was um, honored several times for her coverage of the political and humanitarian crisis there. She has also covered California politics and the business of gambling for the Associated Press. Um, Hannah, I wanted to um, begin by asking you to talk a little bit about um, how you became, first of all, interested in the phenomenon that, that is MS-13. Did it precede um, President Trump's uh, invocation of this, um, of this group repeatedly during the, the campaign season? Yeah, I mean, Julie was just talking about going and digging into something that she knew about and everybody sort of knew about and finding something deeper. This is sort of the opposite of that. Um, I started at ProPublica covering immigration and I hadn't really done any research. I didn't know what I was gonna write about. And the month that I started, Trump happened to go to Long Island and he gave this big speech about MS-13 and he was basically saying, MS-13 is gonna come, they're criminal immigrants, they're gonna rape your daughters, they're gonna ruin your suburbs. And so I didn't know yet, but I thought maybe if I went out there, I would find that this was overblown. Like maybe there was a story about MS-13 being this boogeyman. I knew that the gang was mostly staying the same size and had been in this country for a long time. And so I went out there and it to me was just like a lesson in the importance of getting on the ground because the story that I found was totally different. Um, I started talking to these immigrant kids and immigrant families and they were telling me that they were really scared of the gang. It wasn't overblown for them. And they were having all of this trouble getting help from the police. And so I started hearing these like nightmare stories about girls being kidnapped by MS-13 members and the police wouldn't go look for them. Or teenagers getting deported because some teacher thought that they were MS-13 when they totally weren't. Um, informants getting turned over to ICE. And um, parents whose kids were missing. And parents were telling me, like, my son's been missing for a year. I know something terrible has happened. And the police just keep, like, they keep telling me that he's a runaway. They keep telling me that he's a gang member. But, like, I know that's not true. And so from that massive reporting, I started pulling out these different narratives. But none of them were things that I would have known, you know, before I got there. You portray in your stories um, a picture of high school like none I've ever encountered before. Um, I think at one point, Brentwood High School on Long Island, um, one of the largest public schools in Long Island, I think had five students murdered. Um, the extent of the fear that's involved, the, the, the fact that suburban woods that might normally be associated with kind of hiking or innocuous activities became you know, a site of horrendous kind of torture. How did you get young people, especially young people, many of whom themselves uh, having fled persecution or violence in Central America, to open up to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I hadn't done a lot of reporting really with teenagers before this. Had not? No, I hadn't. Um, <laughs> just thought that writing about children is so hard. It's like I worried that stories might be cloying, or I just sort of avoided it in the past. Um, but with these stories, the gang members and the victims were both mostly immigrant teenagers at this one high school. And so I sort of couldn't avoid it. Um, and one thing that I did was spend a lot of time in the community. So like when I first started reporting, I walked around these woods where they were finding the bodies. I, this was sort of stupid, like I did this because I didn't understand what was really happening in the woods. But you could walk around these woods and there were just like MS-13 markings on the trees or like mattresses that the kids had set up where they were holding their meetings. Um, and I spent a lot of time at the McDonald's where the teenagers hung out after school. And I sort of just built a network of these, of these kids, the gang members and just the normal immigrant kids. So like now my Facebook feed is mostly these kids with their weird memes and sort of gross things. I need to unfriend them now that the stories are done. But that really helps me know, like, you know, somebody could mention a new name and I could usually go and find them um, just sort of using Facebook's algorithm, whatever, whatever that is. That's so interesting. I mean, tell us a little bit, was Facebook a helpful reporting tool? And, you know, did you find yourself, you know, um, text messaging with, you know, 14 year olds at two in the morning in Spanish, like how, like, how, how did your modes of communication um, adjust to the subjects? Yeah, I mean, after doing this reporting, I sort of feel like every future story I do, I want to get access to my subject's Facebook profile because it was so helpful. Um, so for the first story that, that I did in this series, I wrote about a MS-13 informant. This was a kid who was recruited into the gang when he was 12, and um, he killed somebody in El Salvador. He fled to the US, and he was out of the gang for a couple months, and then they found him again at this high school, Brentwood, Brentwood High, and um, he was recruited back in, and he went to law enforcement to try to get out of the gang and he was informing to this FBI handler, and the FBI handler then betrayed him and turned him over to ICE. And he was put in jail and deportation proceedings with all the people he had just informed on. And they knew, because ICE had written in his file that he was an informant. So he told, when I first heard this story, I didn't believe it. That it just seemed like there were so many things that seemed unlikely. And um, it really wasn't until I got his phone and all of his Facebook messages that I was convinced because there were years of messages with him carrying out gang orders or telling other friends he wanted to get out of the gang, talking to his Facebook, his like um, FBI handler through Facebook Messenger. Henry let you copy his phone? He is, did. What, what, is that, uh, what, did, what does that mean and what did that involve? Well, copying a phone is really easy. Um, it turns out. Um, Funny, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I'd, been, um, I'd been sort of talking with him and his lawyer. He was 18 when we were doing the story, so I kept his lawyer pretty involved just for sort of consent reasons. Um, I'd been talking to them about this, and they called me during like a storm in the winter, and they said, okay, we've decided you can copy this phone. Um, his lawyer had his phone. And so I ran to a tech store and I bought the same Samsung phone that I knew he had and I drove through the storm and I was like, let's do this. Like I totally just bluffed, like I knew how to copy a phone and I was Googling it as we were like setting it up on the table. Um, but yeah, it turns out like if you Google it, the first hit is the right hit and it's, it's really easy to do. <laughs> time, um, time tested methods. <laughs> and but so, you were able to see in real time, I mean, you were able to see his archived conversations going back years in some cases, right? Yeah, going back all the way to El Salvador. And they were all written in this sort of gang slang. It took me a while to figure out how to, how to read them because it wasn't in normal Spanish. It was in this sort of like gangster rapper Spanglish. Um, and I, I did a lot, it was 2,000 pages, I think, of messages. So I did a lot of word searching with like the word and then the misspellings of the word and then like the gang version of the word. Um, but yeah, it really helped me trust what he was telling me. And so using that lesson for the next story that I did, um, the next story was about the kids who were murdered by the gang. There were 11 teenagers who were killed and how their parents were dismissed by police. So for this next story, we focused on the first of those kids, a 15-year-old um, named Miguel, 
who was killed by the gang. Um, his mother knew immediately that something was wrong. He was like this total mama's boy. He had beanie babies at home, and he, had all these, he would draw his family um, all the time. So his mother knew he hadn't run away, but it took the police eight months to admit that. For eight months, they said, no, like your kid's just a bad kid. Remind us the pretext for why Miguel was singled out for, for death. So I think that what happened was Miguel was, he was basically fronting like a gang member. Like he was trying to be cool. He had just moved from Ecuador and he would wear a red bandana one day or he would wear rosary beads another day. And he was sort of mixing different gang symbols. Kind not of didn't knowing. know what he was, not knowing what, how parallels yeah. that, yeah. And I mean, that's, that's how most of these kids got killed. It was really stupid stuff like that or like being disrespectful in lunch. Um, so his family was telling me he's a mama's boy, he loved us, he would never get involved with this gang. But again, I didn't really believe, like I just didn't know. And to do a reconstruction, I felt like I needed to have more authority. And so um, I asked them to log me into his Facebook account and they figured out how to get into his account. And wow. in, in those messages, in his Facebook messages, were the messages with the gang members who had lured him out to his death. Um, and the police had never... They had never found this. Yeah, they'd never asked for this. Um, so yeah, ask for, you know, ask for those Facebook messages. Ask, um, one of the things I find so striking about your coverage, including um, this story, is that your compassion extends to the authorities. Um, you kind of look at people in the bureaucracy and the kind of structural position they inhabit in it, and you kind of see the barriers and constraints they face too. Um, which isn't to say that you you exonerate the the inhumanities that have happened, but you write with a lot of nuance. Could you tell us a little bit about getting to law enforcement to trust you, and to be able to write about the balance uh, between local law enforcement and federal, and the relationship between the two? Yeah, I mean, for these stories, Long Island is is like Trump country, and people were very suspicious of the media. Um, when I first came onto the series, I think the police trusted me a lot more. Um, I think they read me as like not a threat or like not doing serious investigative journalism. And so they gave me ride-alongs, they gave me lots of access, and then as soon as the first story came out, they completely cut that off and they blocked my email address from the police department, they blocked my phone number. Um, they started warning people not to talk to me. But luckily, that first story, I think, got the attention of some people who felt um, unhappy with how things were going. And so other people started to reach out to me as the police department cut off access. And they were very scared. Um, I talked to some people in the FBI who would send me screen caps of the place that they wanted me to meet. They wouldn't say, like, this Starbucks. They would send a picture of the Starbucks. And then when I was almost there, they would call me and they would say, like, turn off right now. Like, meet me in the field. <laughs> Um, but I think that like, they were willing, they felt like they were taking a lot of risks and I think they were willing to do that because they had seen this happen for so long out there. And I think law enforcement, I mean, nobody wants children to get killed. And the police on Long Island were very callous in some ways. Um, they had a phrase, misdemeanor murder, that they used to talk about a, like a bad kid getting killed. Um, but I think part of that was because they felt frustrated. Like this is a police department that polices majority Spanish speaking towns where three people speak fluent Spanish. Um, I think they felt like they couldn't solve these murders and they couldn't do their jobs. And so that bred some callousness, but I think that also bred people who, who wanted to expose what was happening. You also write about the connections between the, cent the gang problem in the US and the violence that went um, in which the U.S. was involved in the 70s and 80s in Central America. Could you, um, is it, do you think that those dynamics are widely understood and what can journalists do to help better draw the connections between problems at home and geopolitical uh, violence and trauma abroad? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a cycle. I saw it in this first story that I wrote about um, this 18-year-old gang informant. He had been recruited in El Salvador by a man who had spent most of his life in California. And that's the way this gang works. They, it was started in California. There was a wave of deportations. Gang members went back to El Salvador. One of them recruited this person who I ended up writing about. And then this new generation of kids has tried to flee the gang or flee general conditions there and come back to the US. And I do think it's really important to think about that when we're thinking about this gang. Like it, 
It's a gang that lives in this cycle. It's not a gang that you can like deport away. Um, but also, I, I started out thinking that these were immigration stories um, because there's so much attention, and I think rightly there's so much attention on the ways that law enforcement is attacking immigrants and deporting immigrants. But now I see them much more as a story about how immigrants need help from law enforcement. Like really, the MS-13 stories are about criminal justice, I think, as much as they're about immigration issues. Uh, do you think the stories have done anything to help dispel some of the myths around MS-13? Um, I mean, I think people have read them. I wrote a, an explainer, like five things that Trump gets most wrong about MS-13. I wrote this a year and a couple months ago, and I still get hate mail about it today. Like yesterday, somebody was writing to me about this. So I know people are reading it, which is good. Um, and I mean, we were talking about like the impact that these stories can have. And in a perfect world, people would read these stories and then understand that MS-13 isn't sign that immigrants are criminals and that it's just a gang like any other gang and there are a lot of police bias issues that go into what happens there and make reforms. The Long Island police have made some reforms, like the detectives we wrote about are under internal affairs investigations now and they've hired a lot more Spanish speakers and a Latino liaison, whatever that means, to work with immigrants. Um, but I think what the stories have really done is help some people have more compassion for for immigrants in this country and immigrants who are being targeted by the gang. And I get notes from people sometimes saying, this is the first time I feel compassion for an illegal alien. And that for me is, is really meaningful and sort of the highest purpose that um, a certain type of investigative reporting can have. What has become of Henry, the young um, informant who was um, hauled off after cooperating with the authorities and helping them crack into the gang? So Henry, when I met him, I almost worried that he was trying to commit suicide by journalism. He was in such a dark place. He talked about death constantly, and he seemed like he was about to be killed, like he was about to be deported, and the gang had said that they would kill him, and there was no reason to think that wouldn't happen. Um, so he was, he was just in such a dark, dark place. And after the stories ran, people donated like tens of thousands of dollars to him and came forward to help him build an escape plan. So now he's in hiding, he's in Europe, and it's, it's like he's a different person. He's just like a normal teenager. Like he texts me photos of like people he's seeing and he's, um, he has a girlfriend, he's got a job. How did he get, manage to get, a, get out of federal detention? Um, well, so after the stories ran, it was a very weird thing. The story ran in a magazine, and, in New York Magazine, and um, it ran right ahead of his, his hearing. And when I went into the courtroom, there were copies of this magazine everywhere. So like the judge had the magazine, and the ICE lawyer was paging through it and like looking at me like she was about to completely bring me down with some secret knowledge she had that I hadn't found. And all these people came forward to testify on his behalf. So his FBI handler came forward, his school principal, and that basically dragged his yep. hearing on, which was frustrating, but ended up being a good thing for him because it put him in a position to have a real plan. And in the end, the judge deported him. The judge said, I believe you were informant. I believe you were terribly wronged by law enforcement. But he cited the State Department country report that said that El Salvador has really become a very safe place. <laughs> um, so he's basically like, I'm sorry, but your country is, is doing great. So. Um, but because Henry had all this support um, now, he was able to get, an, it was like a squad of armed guards that met him at the deportation spot in El Salvador wow. and brought him to a hotel and then like a day later got him on another plane out of the country. And therefore out of the cycle of violence that he would have, he would have been trapped in in El Salvador. Yeah, and I mean what he says is that now he really is out of the gang no matter what, because he, he can't go back. So he had wanted to start a new life, and now he really has, sort of in a very hard way, but in a permanent way. Uh, we're now turning our attention to Sarah Stillman, who's a staff writer at The New Yorker and the director of the Global Migration Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Sarah won the National Magazine Award for Public Interest this year for No Refuge about the violent fate that many immigrants in the US face if they are sent back to their home countries. She had previously won another National Magazine Award in 2012 
for her reporting from Iraq and Afghanistan on labor abuses and human trafficking on U.S. military bases, and also received the Michael Kelly Award, an Overseas Press Club Award, and the Hillman Prize for Magazine Journalism. Her reporting on the high-risk use of young people as confidential informants in the war on drugs received a Polk Award and the Mali National Journalism Prize. Sarah was also named a MacArthur Fellow in 2016. Sarah, in reading your stories, I'm struck that family separations has been a thing um, far longer than, uh, than, than necessarily has been apparent to, to people following the mainstream media. Could you tell us about how you began um, writing about this phenomenon and uh, your thoughts about how attention to it has ebbed and or flowed in the, uh, in the years since? Yeah, this story really began as many of my stories begin, which is watching mainstream coverage of something that I care about, immigration and noticing this thing that was between the lines of so many stories I was seeing, this invisible thing, which was this um, phrase that was being invoked on Capitol Hill even prior to Trump's election in the context of Obama. Um, you may remember when there was what people called the unaccompanied minors crisis in 2014. All of these kids were fleeing Central America, showing up at the border. And people kept saying, you know, we could be deporting people to their deaths. And it was always invoked as this hypothetical, like this is the thing we could in the future be doing. And to me, the little journalistic alarm bells went off. Anytime I hear a phrase where it's like, well, what would it look like to really empirically prove that out, to do the shoe leather reporting and to try to actually restore the names and the faces and the specificity to those kinds of cases? Um, and so I naively thought this would be pretty simple. I thought I would just call the immigration sources I've had for years and say, do you know of any specific person who has been deported? and then killed, which you were just describing really eloquently in your case. Um, and what I consistently found is that everyone I spoke to would say, yes, we're really worried this is a big problem, and we hear about it abstractly all the time, but it was quite hard to get anyone to pin down a case. And I think there were two reasons. One is that we have like, astonishingly little visibility on what happens to people post-deportation. So there's so many people working to help prevent a deportation, but once it happens, we have very little um, insight on what unfolds thereafter. Um, and so I thought, you know, what would it look like to try out, in a sense, what IRP innovated, which is in the teaching context, um, I had a team of 17 students. I was teaching a class at Columbia called Gender and Migration. And I thought, um, I was really envious of all my friends who were in law school clinics. Um, these, the clinical legal education model where they would get like 17 people and have them all dig into one complex problem. And so I thought, what if I just did, did that? Because I, I, I forgot to mention that the other reason people's stories weren't coming to light is that there was a huge amount of fear as you documented so incredibly well in your piece. Families were very, very afraid in Central America of retaliation if they spoke about their loved ones who were killed. So we decided in the context of my class to just do a huge amount of outreach to people um, all around the country and then also in the region in Central America to start piecing together essentially a database of cases of deportation to harm. How did you divide up the work? <laughs> We started just actually carving it out state by state. So we thought about um, maybe 10 different categories of types of people we could reach out to. So this included, um, in Central America, we would reach out to mortuaries, to um, migrant shelters, to groups that were working directly with uh, returnees or deportees. And then in the US, we just made a list, like let's go one by one, who are all the people who could potentially have contact with this population? So maybe it's domestic violence shelters who are doing U visa applications for people who were sent back, got sexually assaulted, and then actually returned and found legal status. Because we had to analyze, as, as both of you did, like how do we also keep the sources safe in this equation? And one thing we found is that in some cases, people have been deported, harmed, come back, and then because they had subsequently found legal refuge, those were cases that felt a little bit safer to tell because at least you felt like these were people who had some institutional support around them and who finally had some kind of perhaps precarious but at least modicum of legal status. Tell us how you identified Laura as a driving character in your narrative. You know, I'm always thinking about how do you find one case that people can root into without telling the kind of stories that I think journalism too often tells, which is that I think we often go for the like, let's find one exceptional outlier case that's really kind of emotionally sensational, but is perhaps not going to illuminate the fact that these injustices are structural and systemic. And I fear that often then people can take the bad apple approach and just say, oh, well, this was one crappy police officer or this was one crappy CBP agent. 
And so um, I really thought about um, who was a story that could allow me to carry a reader from A to Z, and then once I do that full narrative arc through that one individual, I can then peel off at certain moments and um, insert other cases uh, within that. And so litigation for me has always been a great avenue to finding <coughs> that one central story. So I found my way to the case of a woman named Laura um, through a lawyer, um, and you can see her photograph there. Um, she was uh, a young woman who'd been living in South Texas, and most of her adult life, she had three US citizen children, and she was driving home from work one night, and she got pulled over by a cop who decided unconventionally at the time, but now characteristic under SB4, which is passed in Texas, to ask about her immigration status. And when he found out uh, she was undocumented, he turned her over to CBP. And she was actually like, pleading and in tears saying, I have a really violent ex-husband. He's right across the border. He's been threatening to kill me consistently. I will be killed. And actually, he, the Border Patrol agent took her that very same night to um, the bridge to walk her across the bridge. And her last words to him were, you know, when I'm found dead next week, my blood will be on your hands. And that is exactly what happened. The husband killed her uh, the very next week after she returned. You managed to get access to Laura's family and wrote very, very vivid and original ways about what they've been going through. Can you tell us a little bit about the reporting process around these victims? Yeah, trauma. I think a lot of my reporting process is informed by the fact that I studied anthropology um, and I think about ethnographic methods a lot when reporting and especially when you're dealing with kids who've gone through a tremendous amount of trauma. It just doesn't feel appropriate to like walk them through a list of questions about such an awful defining incident in their lives. So a lot of it was what an ethnographer would do. It just being, and, and I feel very, very lucky to have the time, which I realize is not a luxury that all reporters have, but I think all of us on this panel were given by editors the luxury to invest the longitudinal, like let us just sit with these families, let us go to church with them, let us, in the case of Laura, I went back um, at the time that um, the family was celebrating her birthday, which they did every year, um, and so on the birthday they would throw Laura a birthday party, and the kids, I noticed, like, they let me kind of come along as they were doing their celebrations, and they would write little notes to their mom that they attached to balloons and then put up into the sky. Um, and so I got some really meaningful material just from following their own words. Like, one of the kids actually brought out um, a uh, poem that he'd written to his mom that was something like, um, wave after wave crushes over me, um, but I remember my mom's words to stand on my own two feet. And I felt like I knew I wanted his poem in the piece. And thinking anthropologically, I think, also means thinking in artifacts. So things like that, things like um, words and poems and pictures and getting them to dredge that stuff up for me. I feel there are also, there's a lot of history and context in your stories, of course. Um, you write, for example, about the <laughs> legal boundaries that are created around who is deemed acceptable, uh, uh, in term, who is deemed worthy of legal protection. Could you talk a little bit about some of those boundaries? I, I'm just thinking about yeah. the, you know, the law seems to suggest that someone has a reasonable per fear of persecution if, for example, they're a political dissident, but if they're a woman fleeing a, a homicidal um, spouse or domestic partner, it seems yeah. to be a very different kind of story. Yeah, that felt really critical to me. Going back to that theme of how do you connect the individual human story to something broader and more structural and systemic, to me, like history felt like an integral part of that. So I tried to have a section of the piece that was really writing about the kind of post-World War II context in which we created the construct of a refugee. How did we do that? Why did we do that? The fact that in some respects that was uh, an atonement for our failures in the past, including, I mentioned in the piece, the history we have uh, as Americans of having turned away boats of uh, Jewish refugees fleeing the Holocaust and having many of those people sent back to their deaths. Um, so I, I struggled a little bit with the dryness of that history. So one of the things, since this is the How the Sausage Was Made panel, one of the things I thought a lot about was how I could use character to um, narrate that history. And one of the remarkable things in this case is that Laura's um, family's attorney, since they decided to sue CBP after her wrongful deportation, um, her attorney, Jennifer Harbury, was this exceptional woman with a crazy personal story of having fallen in love um, during the Central American Wars with a, a man who was a fighter in Guatemala who had gone um, missing 
that the government was involved in his case. And she had been very immersed in those wars of another era that feel, as Hannah mentioned very eloquently, feel very connected to the current refugee crisis. So I thought, how could I use this, this character who happens to fall into this story, Jennifer Harbury, the attorney, and weave into the piece some of the history of Central America's wars as they're implicated in our modern circumstance through her. You're working on compiling a database of uh, people who've died after being deported. Could you tell us about this project? Yeah, I fear this is an example of not necessarily knowing where the boundaries should stop. <laughs> I haven't been able to stop working on this, especially because after the piece came out, we just heard from so many people um, who either were facing deportation and who were wanting to use um, these cases in um, immigration proceedings. Because as you mentioned, one of the things that's often used in people's deportation proceedings is the State Department's reports, which have now been scrubbed of a lot of information realistically reflecting the harm people face back home. So one population that we've been really talking to a lot right now is LGBT folks who've been deported to El Salvador. Um, many of their friends have been murdered and they now um, fear for their lives. Um, so I was just in El Salvador interviewing um, women who are hiding in safe houses, trans women, um, who despite the fact that the State Department actually specifically took out language about LGBT um, deportees facing danger, um, they are now living in daily fear of their lives. So the quick version is essentially that uh, with my team at Columbia, we've tried to um, also expand the database beyond Central America and Mexico. So now we're looking at people who were deported to Somalia and then killed, people who were sent back to Cambodia and who don't know the country to which they were even sent back. Um, I'd like to uh, engage the panel in a few questions now uh, in general discussion and then, of course, uh, open it up to you all for what I hope will be a very lively exchange of views and ideas. Um, I wanted to begin by asking, we've spent a lot of time now talking about the reporting and research process. I wanted to ask about the relationships with your editors. Could each of you give us a sense, give us a moment perhaps, of the most challenging and the most gratifying moments you've had with your editors in working on your projects? You guys go first. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, you can start well, with the challenging. Yeah, so I, um, at ProPublica, the process is, is pretty different than I think a lot of normal news outlets. It's like you sort of have this amazing freedom, which is wonderful, but you can also feel like you're drowning in freedom sometimes. Um, and I was just talking to the, um, our editor-in-chief, Steve Engelberg, recently, and he was telling me that at ProPublica, you can sometimes feel like um, your editors are pushing you out of a plane, <laughs> and you have to figure out how to get your parachute working and, and land. And with these stories, I did feel like I was in free fall for a long time. And in some ways, there was nothing my editors could do but manage my own like, neuroses, <laughs> which they have a lot of experience doing because everybody goes through this parachute process. And now, having come out the other side of it, I'm such a convert to that way of reporting, like just going out, getting on the ground, and not knowing what story you're going to find. But it's really intense to be in that. And if any of you guys are in that free fall right now, I offer my total sympathies. <laughs> um, but for me, the result was that I did something I think more powerful and bigger than anything I had done before. And I'm really grateful to my editors for sort of holding my hand through that process, but also just letting me go out and be, be a little lost for a while. Because I think for these stories, that was what was necessary. What were the sharpest points of disagreement, if any, in the framing and packaging of the stories? Um, well, like Sarah, I think a lot about having one person that the reader can latch on to. And I think I probably didn't trust readers as much as my editors did. So I was always thinking, as soon as we digressed a little bit into like history or maybe another example, that people were going to get bored and stop. And um, my editors would sort of reassure me that no, it could, you know, they've read whatever, 4,000 words. It's not this sentence that's going to push them over the ledge. Um, and, you know, I also, but I think sometimes I was right. And we did, <laughs> and so we did lose some material that was really strong investigative material, but I think was more than the, the narrative could bear. Um, but just sort of figuring out like that balance of, of story and like personal detail and then structural information that was really important and sort of why we were telling the story in the first place um, 
was probably the point of biggest disagreement, but I think the most important thing also to get right. What about the headlines? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I think with the headlines also, it was sort of this issue of like, I just don't trust people to ever read a story. I sort of assume people don't want to read my story and hate my story, and I have to <laughs> trick them into reading it anyway. And so with the headlines, my editors wanted to go with these very like evocative um, headlines. Like the first story was called A Betrayal. And um, my inclination was maybe to go with something more like SEO friendly to be really crass about it. <laughs> Just because I want people to read the story and read all the way to the end. And that's my sort of my driving yeah. um, way of thinking about things. Wow, very interesting. But, you know, in the end, a lot of people read the stories, and I have to admit my editors were right on that point, and I'm glad they, that we have sort of nice headlines, not like tricking you into reading about an immigrant headlines. Julie, what about you? Oh, <laughs> um, we, we fought. We had a couple fights. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's hard to explain. We, do a project like this, it's just, uh, you put so much energy into it and then, you know, you spend months and months and all these women that trusted me and uh, my videographer who worked on it with me came on all these interviews and we sort of felt like, I think, a little bit similarly that we were out on a limb and on our own little island and that nobody, including our editor and including her photo editor, nobody understood us. We were all by ourselves, we were like this pity party all the time, but we just kept potting along. And, and I, had, I did have a concern from the very beginning uh, because even though I've worked with this editor, uh, Casey Frank, for a very long time, he's still a guy. And um, this was a very uh, delicate story. So Mindy, our executive editor, I went to her very early on in the project and I said that, uh, you know, I really wanted her eye on the story. Um, there were issues, for example, where, um, you know, Casey kept coming back to me and saying, instead of calling them victims, he wanted to call them accusers. And I kept pushing back and doing my own thing and pushing back. And then I remember one time I finally just got so mad because he kept hounding me about it that I found a story, I think it was in the Washington Post, about how you know, journalists should not be calling victims of sexual assault accusers because, for example, if someone gets robbed, you don't call the person that got robbed an accuser. You know? And so the other thing was a lot of these women were already listed as part in the FBI case as being definitely victims. So we were safe in calling them that. But that was just one example of things where hmm. we weren't seeing eye to eye. And you know, there were moments where we were, you know, got in a conference room screaming a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, and I think we, were, it, we just had put so much time and energy into the project. And it becomes very, especially a story like this, it becomes very emotional. I want the, the, the victims treated right in the story. And, uh, you know, I just, I was, you know, you get, you get very tied to these people and how the story presents them. And the editor isn't on the ground with you all the time. So you have to, in some ways, you have to educate your editor. And that takes a lot of energy on top of you doing the story yourself. You've got to kind of work with the editor and make them understand why you have to present this in this particular light. You know, we, we argued, for example, over one sentence, which was um, uh, the women who brought a lawsuit against the U.S. government, um, this has been, they filed this lawsuit right after he was sentenced in 2008, and it's still going on. Yeah. And so I had a sentence in the story that says, you know, that these women were still fighting for an elusive justice, that even time, even the passage of time is not made right. And he wanted to take the whole sentence out. And he, we had, I'd already agreed to take out some of that, and I didn't want to take the sentence out. I said, I'm not taking it out. And he goes, well, what does that sentence mean? passage, uh, nothing, time doesn't make anything right. And I said, what are you talking about? Look at Cosby. I mean, there definitely have been cases mm. that have the ta passage of time has changed the way that things, people think about it. Yep. So, yep. Yep. Um, so I won that battle. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, tell us some I feel like I didn't have enough duking it out, like screaming <laughs> matches with my editor. 
I happen to work with someone, Deirdre Foley Mendelssohn, who is such a yeah. gift in managing the emotional, both neuroses and like ups and downs of like, does anyone care about this topic when you invest a lot of time? And she recently um, mentioned in passing a word that she felt described my approach, which was maximalist, which I felt was like a very general, uh, uh, generous way of saying like you over report by a factor of a thousand <laughs> so I feel like her role as editor one of the many gifts she has brought to the table for me is just thinking about almost like the emotional mathematics of empathy like what is the mathematical point at which you've just exploded someone's capacity to keep following what you're trying to say if you stuff too many cases in there which is my tendency I really really have a hard time letting anything go to the cutting room floor. And I really wanted every single case that we found to be in this piece. And we all know, because everyone in this room has <clears throat> dealt with these quandaries in some way or another, that like there's a point at which the more you try to do justice to all the stories, the more you diminish each one of them. And so it was a gift to work with someone who helped me with that balancing act and who did that really through kind of what I was describing before, finding like, okay, here's the one story that's gonna carry the reader. And then you know, Seymour Hersh had this phrase, do the cron, basically like map out the full chronology of that one central story. And then by analyzing the cron, you can know kind of what are the moments of maximum suspense where I can now pause and stuff in some other material because I've got the reader hooked and I can right. maybe like, escape with a little bit more in there. What do you think, has, <laughs> how do you think Deirdre learned to become such an effective narrative editor? Oh my gosh, well she's been on a journey. The, the interesting thing about working with Deirdre for me is that she was actually working at the magazine, at the New Yorker, on my very, very first piece that I reported from Iraq and Afghanistan in 2000. 10 or 11 or something like that. And then she left and went to a number of different places, all of which are really centered around um, leading with story. Places like California Sunday, um, yep. where she and spent Har time at Harper's. Harpers. Yep. Yes. Um, and then I should also say, we, one of the great things about The New Yorker is we have this whole like team behind us. So we've got the, an amazing editor, but we also have, I know the fact-checking department is here and represented in the audience today. Um, so even like, the checkers have brought a lot to the process, especially one like this where there's like a lot of different cases they have to check. But they also, I really value, often they'll find new reporting. So one of the things they've helped me think about, I'll always ask, well, what stood out to you kind of emotionally while they're doing the checking? And then they'll glean little details. Like I remember one of them was um, talking to one of Laura's loved ones and they learned um, a song that she had loved to listen to while she was picking apples. Um, this was in the time before she was killed. And I often think in reporting, how do we incorporate things that aren't just people's moments of trauma, aren't just people's moments of violence, but people's moments of aliveness. And so I was really grateful that the fact checker, Stefania, um, had actually found this extra little flourish that I then wove into the piece. Um, one final question before we open it up to the, to the audience. Um, how do you manage kind of the, both the ethics of, of talking to people who've been through tremendous pain and doing so that doesn't exacerbate their suffering? And how, in turn, do you take care of yourselves while you're at it? Um, well, I, I did a lot of homework before I did this piece. Um, I, I had covered vulnerable communities before, as I said, but um, this was different than anything I had done before. Unfortunately, I've never been a victim of sexual assault, so I didn't know what that was like. So I interviewed a lot of psychologists about it. And I also interviewed uh, law enforcement people that do this and are good at it and know how to do it. Because think about it, it's sort of the same kind of thing. You're, you're asking someone to tell, to tell the most intimate details of one of the worst times of their whole life. And so I, you know, I learned about sexual trauma, which does strange things to your brain. Um, for example, one of the things that the law enforcement people told me was, you know, especially children who suffer from um, sexual abuse, it, 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 what he said was it's very normal for them not to remember, to remember portions of it, but not to remember other aspects of it. That's what your brain kind of does. And that, in fact, if they tell consistent story, that's an indicator that they aren't telling the truth. And that these prosecutors who handled this case went the exact opposite way because these girls and the lawyers were very, the defense attorneys were very 
good at, at saying, well, see, she doesn't even know this, or she, uh, she really cared about this guy. Well, it's common for se children of sexual assault. These men, what, the men, what Epstein did was make them feel special and make them feel like he was going to help them out of their misery and get them in college. So it's very common for all those factors to be in place. But what these prosecutors and defense attorneys did was they used it as a way to dismiss them. So I don't know if I answered your question, but one of the things that I did was I understood from the get-go the manipulation and the, and the additional trauma that these girls were under, and I had to convince them that I understood that. And once I did, I think it made them more able to co confide in me. That's very helpful. Yeah, I also tried to study trauma a little bit. I took a fellowship with the DART Center, which is a great resource for any kind of trauma reporting. And one of the things I learned there that was helpful all of the whole year was the difference between a hot memory and a cold memory. So what you know, people who study this say is that if somebody is talking to you and they're sort of recounting something almost like rote, like they've told a story a lot, that's a cold memory and it's very unlikely to re-traumatize them. And then when they switch to sort of talking about something like it's happening, like they're sort of experiencing it and you can tell like people start breathing more quickly, people cry a lot with that kind of memory. That's when you really have to worry. Um, and so with these stories, I tried to keep people in like the cold memory land as much as I could. So I interviewed one father who had found his own son's like hacked up bodies in the woods in 2017 along with three friends, and I, I had to ask him about that because he had asked the police for help. The police hadn't helped him, and he had gone and found these bodies himself. But it wasn't going to be the focus of the story, so I sort of tried to steer him away from that like hyper-detailed storytelling that usually I'm looking for. Um, and with the person who we were focusing on, like she just cried through a five-hour interview once. Like It was all hot memory. Um, but I tried to give her a lot of control over stopping the interview or like when she wanted to talk again, maybe in a week or like two weeks. Um, and also just because we were writing about children, we had to think a lot about trust. I think we all sort of had that issue. Um, and one thing ProPublica did, um, this decision actually went all the way up to Steve to the head of ProPublica. We offered Henry, the teenage informant, a chance to kill the story because we didn't want to do something that he wasn't 100% in on. So two weeks or something before that story ran, we had a real talk about maybe not doing it at all. And that made me feel much better when the story ran and I couldn't get in touch with him for two days and was like terrified that something had happened. Um, I felt really good about how we had been careful about publishing it. Did you share the story with Henry before publication? No, you know, it was the weirdest thing. It, there's no way to share it. Like, the worst thing for Henry would have been a copy of that story ending up in the jail that he was in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't see it until, until he got out just a couple of months ago. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned the Dart Center. I always proselytize on their behalf because it is such an amazing resource for people doing trauma-related reporting, D-A-R-T. It, I, I feel like one of the things that they have really underscored in the trainings I've done with them is that even at the most like neurobiological level, trauma is constituted by the loss of control. And so many of the, the skills you learn as a journalist and certainly the things people teach in journalism schools are all about like holding power to account. And I think so often in the context of trauma, we need to think about the opposite. How do we actually, in the context of an interview with someone who's gone through a lot, cede some of our power in the equation to let them determine everything from you know where is the interview going to take place and how long will it take place and will we pause and and take a break for an hour and all of those things that um, were normally taught are like signs that you're a bad journalist if you if you cede that control to a source I think in this particular context it feels kind of imperative and then I guess the one other quick thing I would say about that um, I feel like I've learned a lot from litigators in this way. Um, so the very, very first piece that I did that I mentioned earlier from Iraq and Afghanistan, I had been just so timid and so worried that I, I was reporting on women who had been both trafficked and sexually assaulted. And I felt like um, in trying to get their stories and trying to kind of do the cron with them, I felt like maybe I was violating um, or I, I just asking a lot of them. And then I got to watch a team of litigators come in and, and interview these same women. And they really went from the very, very, very beginning, because as you mentioned, the timelines in trauma are often so fractured, they just took people back to the very beginning and said, we're gonna walk you through this step by step, starting at like 
point one, and then they walked them through across a period of hours, all these very, very granular things. And I realized not only did the women not feel in that context um, violated or overly taxed by that, they kind of rose to the equation and the way that they were narrating their story shifted to fit the granularity of the questioning because I think a lot of people just feel grateful to be fully heard. And so I've shifted away from being almost patronizingly protective um, to also create space for like really listening to what someone is ready and wanting to share. Also, just to add, I think once they understand that you're not there to traumatize them and they, and they understand what your goal is, my goal was not to sensationalize what happened, but was to, to expose the injustice that happened. And once they understood that, it was after I did the interview, I remember one of them calling me like an hour later and saying to me, I can't believe how good I feel. Mm. I've been trying to tell everybody this story, the real story of what happened. And you were the first person that really understood exactly what we went through. And it was almost like a big relief that they were finally ever able to do that. So. We will now uh, use the remaining time to entertain some questions uh, from our audience. Uh, is there a microphone, Janice? Uh, yeah, thank you. Who wants to begin? Don't be shy. Uh, I, I Do you want to wait for the? I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, in Boston, where I live, uh, somebody has uh, spray painted Google Jeffrey Epstein. It's got, it's everywhere. I saw cars, uh, uh, wow. walls, um, public buildings. Is this something that you've seen in other places? And I'm just wondering, is this like it just seems really unique, kind of like the visceral note that it hit? Um, any reaction to that? And I've heard about it in a couple of other places. I think that in some ways it's, it's something to taunt Trump. I don't know. I don't know what someone is doing this in a couple different places around the country, but someone in Boston sent me some photographs. I think it was on the side of the courthouse or something like that. I really don't know what that's all about. I think some of the journalists up there should, should get to the bottom of it because it is <laughs> kind of odd. Did Epstein have a connection to Boston? Dershowitz is really well, and Harvard. Yeah, and I mean, Harvard. Harvard right. Right. You know, he's he gave a lot of money to Harvard. You know, there's almost a whole story in that, and uh, with Dershowitz still, <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> uh, and please identify yourself. Um, I, I think this is a question for Julie too, but um, anybody else can jump in and answer it if you had experience with it, but I wondered how the threat of litigation changed your reporting process and how you communicated with your sources and things like that. Well, quite frankly, a lot, uh, the police chief, um, he, had a, he had a lot of skepticism that we would ever do the story. His theory was that over the years, he had spoken with a bunch of journalists off the record. He never wanted to go public on camera or be quoted, but he sort of tried to lead them down certain paths to have them look at this and look at that. And he, he said that every time that happened, <laughs> the journalist that he's spoken to all of a sudden was in the real estate section or something. So he, right or wrong, um, there were a lot of people associated with this case that felt like, uh, what's the point of me talking to you? Because <laughs> Anybody that has ever done this before never really did the real story, so w why should I believe that you're going to do it? And in this particular case, I had the police chief talk to my editors, and again, he reiterated, I don't want to go through all this if you're not going to publish it. And my editor said, well, we're not going to not publish it because someone's going to threaten to sue us. And he said, because if that happened, I would resign my job. So we, we basically just assured them that we were serious about doing it and that we weren't afraid of getting sued, which we were afraid of getting sued. But, <laughs> but we were afraid. But let's just say we felt that we were on solid ground with the story and that I was going to report it in a way that we wouldn't get sued. But you're always afraid that that could happen. Was litigation risk a consideration in your stories? 
In my case, it was um, the flip side that I, since I was writing about litigation, it meant that so much had fallen under seal. And so I learned really like luscious details that were in those documents that I was battling to get my hands on and um, had to be, I feel like that's one of the really frustrating things about writing about litigation is that on the one hand, um, you've got this rich treasure trove of documents oftentimes, but on the other hand, people are often really nervous to speak with you or can't or are legally constrained about speaking with you, which can lead itself to kind of that feeling of one-sidedness. Yeah, but my concerns in that, in that respect were more about kind of safety of sources, maybe that they wouldn't get sued, but that other bad things could happen to them, including threats that they were receiving. I know you dealt with that too. Yeah, no, my main fear was that the sources who were being threatened as they were talking to me by detectives and the gang might, might have something happen to them. Um, and that maybe the detectives we were writing about might sue. Um, with the, to handle that, we tried to take out everything that wasn't bulletproof. So like one detective I wanted to describe as looking like a bodybuilder, but we decided we couldn't totally be sure. Like maybe he's just has <laughs> good genes. you that? <laughs> yeah, so we were hyper cautious with, with those things. Yeah, um, in the back please, yes. You, uh, miss, you in the, next to the door. Yeah. Hi, I'm down on the floor. Um, my name is Ko, and I had a question about um, whether or not your race, being white, came up in reporting on in um, Hispanic communities, and whether or not you felt like that either made you have to work harder to gain trust, or if maybe you hadn't uh, um, were more trusted, and how you kind of navigated that throughout the process of writing your story, knowing that you're not from the community that you're writing about, um, both like culturally and like geographic, excuse me, geographically. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about that because there's a huge diversity problem in this industry and I think there aren't enough Latino people covering these issues at really high levels. And um, I wondered if maybe I shouldn't be writing these stories, honestly, when I started. Um, one way I tried to navigate that was by exploiting my privilege as much as I could in service of the story and in service of doing really hard-hitting reporting. So like I went to, I got a lot of sources on the school and law enforcement side by sort of sneaking into meetings um, because I think I would just read as like, I don't know, very nondescript and then I could buttonhole people who never would have talked to me otherwise. Um, and I think people gave me the benefit of the doubt probably in a way, like just because of how I was reading and I tried to exploit that like as much as I could. Um, well, these were public meetings? Public meetings, meetings where I wasn't <laughs> illegally there, um, like some, some events. Um, I did sometimes get asked to leave, but you know, when that happened, I left. Um, and, but I didn't feel any real suspicion from the people who I was writing about. If anything, I felt like they were giving me their trust too easily and I needed to explain that I wasn't an advocate and, and that the story might not be good for them in the end. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to, to grapple with that issue. Yeah, I'll add, I was so glad to hear that there was the Ida B. Wells event yesterday because I do think part of one's role as a white journalist is thinking about how do we push for our newsrooms to reflect um, the diversity of the kinds of stories that we're trying to tell. Um, it, on my team at Columbia, the team with whom I reported this story, I had a lot of um, people who grew up speaking Spanish and who did come from some of the communities where we were reporting, so that was incredibly helpful. Um, and it's been part of our reporting going forward. But now we're also reporting in places, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Somalia and Cambodia, where we don't have those prior ties. Um, and so thinking about um, what that, that means, I think step one is it's always nice when you do have people who know um, the local language. So for instance, um, right now we're working with um, people on the ground in Somalia, but then you wonder, going back to that risk question, that also oftentimes imposes greater risks on the people who may be there on the ground. Like I'm certainly someone who has the privilege of being able to parachute into certain situations and then go home and not bear those same risks. Um, and I also think about this in the context of gender because I think as a reporter who, um, especially starting out in my career, but even still today, I'm sometimes mistaken for like the student newspaper reporter. <laughs> and so I have tried, I think we're all reporting from whatever position we're coming from and thinking about how do we utilize the, the assets from that. For me, a great privilege sometimes as an investigative reporter is being underestimated. I feel like that can be a secret weapon. Um, so as much as I think we need to fight for inclusion, I, in the meantime, I also try to take moments where someone isn't taking me seriously as a great weapon against them. <laughs> Terrific, terrific question. Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you for your question. I actually was going to ask 
a very similar question. I, my name is Daffodil. We're, we produce the series, The Rape in the Fields, Rape on the Night Shift, Traffic in America for Frontline. And we were very explicit um, in making our teams multicultural, multilingual. And so I'm wondering, one of the things that's come up is this, um, you know, there is trauma training, um, like Dart Center, but what about cultural competency training, which I think is something that newsrooms are now beginning to have a conversation around. But, you know, as you're preparing to go into these different communities, what kind of training are you as journalists not from those communities do you think you should be engaging in? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, as far as language, I think we both speak Spanish. I don't think I could have attempted these stories if I wasn't fluent in the language. Um, like we were already asking so much of these sources, I think to try to do that kind of really intense reporting and just hanging out in their lives and also have another person doing interpretation would have been probably asking too much. Um, but I also think just being able to hang out with somebody for a long time does a lot of that work. Like, I'm sure I had stereotypes about what a Salvadoran immigrant is like going into this. I'm sure I did, like everybody does. Um, but being able to hang out with somebody for months and months and months, you just start to get to know the person and um, I think it's hard to like sort of keep those preconceived ideas once you know somebody so intimately and you've talked about them, like the worst and the best moments of their lives with them. Um, and I don't know if that's something that can really be taught in a training. Like if you're not coming into a situation with a lot of compassion and empathy and like genuine interest in the person in front of you, I sort of doubt that you could be like talked out of that. Um, but even that alone could be taught because I don't know that you know, going in with humility, that's huge. I don't know that journalists historically have always gone in with deep humility, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting that you bring that up. Maybe that could be taught. Well, I think it, it depends on where you come from, you know. I came from, you know, Philadelphia, which is a very culturally, culturally diverse, went to Temple University, uh, mostly black university. And, um, you know, I just, and I'm, you know, I was on my own since I was 16. I think that that I understood these girls for that reason. Um, but also, I covered the prison community for four years in Florida, and I interviewed um, inmates from all walks of life. And I, I just felt compassion for what got them to where they were. I mean, yeah, they committed a crime, but. You know, when you grow up and your mom's on crack and your dad is, you know, in jail and you have all those factors against you, I, for me, from where I came from, I can understand, you know, you don't, you, you hope, you know, sometimes I always say, there by grace of God go I because I came from a background where that could have been me. So I think that some, some journalists come from that kind of background and they understand it. We could use even more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a, another great question. Um, I think I saw a hand on this side at some point. Uh, the woman in the back. Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I run the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. Um, and one of the things that we're dealing with at the moment, we've done lots of um, stories about vulnerable women, um, domestic violence and um, homeless deaths. Um, and one of the things our reporters really struggle with is trying to keep the divide between being a reporter and becoming a counsellor. Um, I wonder if that's something that you've had to deal with and how you've dealt with it. And in particular, once the story has come out, how long do you continue with the relationship with those people? Because you have become a bit of a lifeline, particularly if you've been reporting over a very long time. You've talked about the relationships that you've built. Um, I mean, at what point does your duty of care end? Yeah, it's interesting. We, I mentioned earlier that phrase, the mathematics of empathy, and it can equally apply to the after a story um, comes out phase of things, because I do feel like every story, when you're really being present with people across a long stretch of time, you do start to have this weird kind of conflation of like, am I the journalist or am I the therapist? So I actually went to a therapist, and she told me my job was not to be their therapist. <laughs> and I, I do feel like I've thought a lot about that. <laughs> she was a source or your own therapist? <laughs> no, I went to a therapist who said, your job is not, is not to, to be the therapist. Your job is to tell the truth as you see it. 
Um, and I, I feel like I go a step further though because I'm not entirely comfortable with the old school boundaries we've drawn between, like, I think we have this language of like we're objectively there to tell the truth as we see it and I just can't fully buy into that as someone who has asked people to, be, to bear with me through the most, like the depth of the darkest moments of their lives or the most difficult moments of their lives. It doesn't feel fair to then just be like, oh, sorry, like the story's out and now you're gonna have to find someone else to talk to you about this. But one thing that I have often done recently um, a tip that I got from a therapist friend is to ask people to identify who in their life is their support structure um, because I do think it helps um, for people to realize the people around them to whom they could be sharing. Like when I have had kids come to me after a story came out and continue to share pretty difficult and sometimes really troubling things like suicidal ideation, etc. There are times when it makes sense to um, to actually First of all, and if it's a kid and, and they're in that circumstance, to make sure that an adult is involved in the equation. Um, but when you're dealing with um, a grown-up who, with whom you may have even developed something akin to a friendship, I think it also helps to um, kind of enlist people in contemplating what is the community of care they have around them. Um, I don't know if you've had other strategies. I'm curious to hear what you've turned to. Um, well, I try to do a lot of front-loading because it is weird. It's like we're doing things that best friends do. We're just hanging out with somebody. We want to hear everything about them. Like when my sources call me and I'm working on a story, if I'm on the train, I immediately get off the train. If they call at 2 AM, I take the call. And that probably feels a lot like a friend. And um, I just try to really keep reiterating to people, I'm here as a journalist. You might not like this story. Like my loyalty is, isn't to you. It's to the story. And that's really hard to say to people. But um, I try to be really disciplined. I think partly when, one of the first stories I worked on here in the Bay Area when I was basically an intern was about a um, school principal and the, princi the school principal had been molesting people at his prior job. And the day after the story ran, the principal killed himself. Mm -hmm. And because I was the lowest person in the newsroom, I had to go and do the man on the street interviews <laughs> at his school. And, um, I don't regret doing that story or like helping. I probably wouldn't do Vox Pop interviews for that at this point. But um, that sort of just like colored my <laughs> approach to journalism. Like I just try to imagine the worst case scenario when a story runs and like act accordingly and be honest with my sources. Mm. Um, but I do still take people's calls after the stories run. Like I'm still in touch with all the people I wrote about last year and I'm glad that they don't hate me and that they want to keep talking. <laughs> that seems like a good sign. Don't. Same with me. I, I keep in touch with the, with the girls. They call me and, you know, or something will happen in the news and one of them will text me because they're following, my story's still developing and so they're following every word of it. So all of a sudden they'll see, oh, another woman is suing Dershowitz and they'll be like, oh my gosh, what happened? You know, so they're, they're like, and they're following me on Twitter and so, you know, I still keep in contact with them. Sometimes the characters in narrative nonfiction become so indelible that, you know, the reader wants to more work to come just to find out what happened. I, I felt that recently when uh, my friend Alex Kotlowitz published his book, mm. An American Summer, about, um, about uh, homicide in Chicago over one summer. And the opening anecdote is about Pharaoh, uh, one of the two young boys he uh, wrote about in his um, uh, classic book, There Are No Children Here, more than you know, 25 years ago. Mm. And I just remember opening the page and thinking, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's back. What's happened to Pharaoh? Uh, just, that's just as a reader. So. Something to keep in mind. Um, how much time do we have, Janice? Ten minutes remaining. Good, because I still see several hands. Um, uh, yes, right behind Lowell Bergman. <laughs> do you want to wait for the mic? Sure. And tell us who you are. Oh, I am loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Barish. I'm now a radio journalist again. Um, first off, thank you to each of the three of you for your great reporting. I think what your reporting does is verify our claim that journalists are the voice of the people. Because Hannah Arendt wrote that totalitarianism works by atomizing its citizens, by convincing them that they're each alone and therefore they dare not speak out because they're isolated and unsupported. And the whole process of journalism uh, 
is to take what could be awful anecdotes and by aggregating the victims and finding the victimizers, pointing out that this is not just a sad story, but a structural defect in our system. Um, and I'm wondering whether your experiences in reporting your stories, whose victims are all in the bottom 1% of the 99%, and all are structurally as atomized as you can get, either as illegals or recent refugees or, quote, trailer trash, that even if you had a hundred of them, it would be a hundred times nothing until you put their stories together and then attach them to the victimizer. I'm wondering whether in doing these stories, you deepened your own sense of your structural role in a democracy of radical inequality. Wow. <laughs> She's probably best to answer. Yeah, okay. So it's, well, it's funny because I thought you were going to say, you said voice. We'll start with the writer from the New Yorker. <laughs> okay. So you said voice for the, and I thought you were going to say voice for the voiceless. Because the thing I get oftentimes when I'm on panels is like, thank you for being the voice for the voiceless. And that goes back to the questions that were raised earlier. I feel so uncomfortable with that paradigm because it implies that people, there's a whole set of people who are like voiceless when in fact they've had voices all along and a lot of people no, aren't listening, listening to them. Yeah. Um, and so even this, the, even the language of like victims and victimizers, I think sometimes as illustrated by much of the work on this panel, like sometimes that dichotomy is very clear and very true. But oftentimes, and a lot of the work I'm most interested in is work that breaks down that binary in and of itself because a lot of the cases that I fought hardest to include in the deportation to harm piece were cases of people who would fall under the bus of that particular binary because they had a criminal conviction. I'm thinking of a mother named Yadira who is living here in California. She had a criminal conviction because she developed an addiction because her she was in a complex partnership where she was being sexually assaulted and she turned to drugs. She got a drug charge and she was sent back and killed. And she's the kind of person who's left out of so much of our language about immigration reform where we say, as Obama said, you know, it's about families, not felons. She falls into that felons camp. So yeah, part of how I think about kind of the restoration of democracy to use your kind of um, framework in the context of the kind of reporting we can do for me, a lot of that is just breaking down those, those notions that it is always as simple as victimizers and, and victimized. And that sometimes people play both of those roles. Yeah, no, I feel like if there's one thing that this panel can accomplish, it can like get voice for the voiceless out of the <laughs> discussion around investigative journalism. <laughs> that would make me so happy. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think like Sarah, probably like most people who do narrative journalism, I look for people who are proactive in their own lives because that just makes a more compelling story. But also I think that's how most people perceive themselves. Like we're all the heroes of our own stories. I don't think it's that authentic usually to portray somebody as just a simple victim. Um, especially immigrants, because you know immigrants, they've already made this huge choice. They've come all the way here, especially if they're poor. Like That is so hard and brave. And I just haven't encountered a lot of people who seem like, oh, they're just you know, playing the victim um, or think of themselves that way. So I know, I, I mean, reading your guys' stories, I think you must have done this too, but I know that I try to structure my stories around the decisions that people are making to try to like, bring that part of, of these characters alive. I mean, Dave, you ask a very profound question. I mean, if, if, if I dare venture a bit of an answer, you know, I, don't, I don't think that investigative journalism can alone arrest or reverse some of the forces of eroding trust, stagnant wages, widening inequality, uh, deepening political polarization, and challenges to liberal values around the world. I can't single-handedly do that but I surely don't see a solution to some of these immense global challenges without investigative journalism. So, it's a question over here. Hi, I'm Jason from the Investigative Reporting Program. Um, first of all, amazing work. Uh, I just have a question for each of you. First, a, a sort of a comment, Julie, this is sort of directed at you. Uh, this, there's been sort of like a resurgence uh, in like far right or kind of fringe conspiracy um, that has been mainstreamed um, under Donald Trump's presidency. 
And one of those big conspiracy theories was Pizzagate, which is sort of, you, you're probably familiar with it. It's this, for people who aren't, it's this, this uh, conspiracy about powerful people that have a, a smuggling ring of children, smuggling children um, and uh, basically a sex trafficking ring. And I'm wondering, like, for you, how it is to see these conspiracies unfold and get so much traction when, meanwhile, you're uncovering, like, an actual story with actual documents of the same thing happening with powerful people from across the wow. aisle, like, politically. Um, so that's my first question. Second question for all three. Um, uh, as women writing about topics um, that, that spur just, like, insane vitriol online... What steps do you take to keep like your identities safe, and how do you prevent doxing? And do you feel like your newsrooms take enough steps to protect you when when a story like this is coming out? Um, well, I, you know, before I started this story, I, you know, that pizza I had you know heard all about that PizzaGate, and just a funny uh, anecdote about this. Um, my brother, who I'm not very close with, he lives in New Jersey, um, texted me one day. This is when I first started uh, working on the story, and he goes, he started with this babbling about, oh, you're going to get Hillary and all this kind of stuff. And I, at first I thought it wasn't even him, and, I, and I, I, <laughs> I thought this can't be, somebody got his cell phone or something. And, and so, so finally I called him, and I said, Jack, what is all this about? And he said, Oh, I saw something about you. I said, where? He said, oh, there's a whole piece on YouTube about you. And I'm like, what? Because we had filed a lawsuit, and I guess someone, Chernovich, or I don't know who it was, got a hold of it and did a piece and do it, did it. And apparently my brother has been watching all this stuff on the dark web. And he was, like, so proud of me. And anyway, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was Wait, just would, very you bizarre. Named, you had been named in a lawsuit. Related, I was named because relating it, to the it, journalism. Yeah, it was Julie Brown in the Miami yeah, Herald suing yeah. for these documents in right. New York. And anyway, I had, I kind of had braced myself that there was going to be a lot of that going on with this story. But then when my own brother was in it, I actually had to block him for a while because he was going, <laughs> he was just going too nuts over the whole thing. And you know, it's it's uh, you know, it, it, this story has a lot of that attached to it and I kind of had to just you know put it aside so um and you know I I always tell people when they ask me about are you afraid I always say I don't really think about it until somebody asks me and then I start thinking well maybe I better be afraid but I just you know I I'm careful I tell my kids to be careful you know my son doesn't lock the door enough I say Jake, I know you don't know what your mom does, really. You don't pay attention, but you gotta lock this door because there are people that might not like me, you know. And he, he just, you know, they don't really. They think of their mom. I think is pretty fearless, so they pretty much think that nothing's going to happen. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I I definitely get a lot of angry Twitter messages as a woman covering a polarizing issue. When I was in Venezuela, my editor had a saying that Twitter death threats aren't real death threats. So I, I go by that, and it's sort of comforting. Yeah, right. My answer is I'm not on Twitter, <laughs> which will shock many of you. But yeah, I have stayed off of a lot of social media. But yeah, I do manage a good, st steady stream of uh, incoming hate mail via email. So there's always other ways people can reach you. But yeah, I, I, I don't, I haven't faced kind of the level of what you've. Uh, just described, but I do think one of the things that's very confusing um, and that I hope I'll learn more about at this conference is that it seems like it's our responsibility now to understand good protocols uh, on the internet, especially when it comes, as we mentioned earlier, to protecting our sources. And it seems like so many of the things we can do to protect ourselves in those ways often are the very things that flag us as people who are trying to protect ourselves, which then flags you for further scrutiny. So I think that that's a very complex paradox that I'm hoping I'm going to get some tidbits on at this conference. In closing, I really want to thank our panelists for representing. <laughs> I will just end it at representing, but I was going to say. <laughs> Um, representing some of the most um, courageous and principled and compassionate work uh, that we as journalists are privileged to uh, be part of. And thank you so, for, so much for being generous with your time. Thanks, Thanks.